I'm Alan Alda. In 2007, the directors of the then 15 Kavli Institutes gathered together for the first time to celebrate Fred Kavli's 80th birthday. I sat down with Fred on a bluff overlooking the Pacific Ocean to find out what had inspired the Kavli Foundation. And you have such a great view of nature here. Oh, I love it. Yeah, it's nice. You know, I was, I was there uh, the day you were inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Oh, that was fun, wasn't it? It was fun. <laughs> and, and, and when you spoke about nature, mm -hmm. uh, it was very interesting. It was kind of moving to hear you talk about it. I think as a boy being in the mountains of Norway and seeing the starry sky and your awe at that. Did that get you into science, do you think? Oh, I think so. The, 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 the way it started, I guess, is as it does often. You look at the sky and you wonder what's out there. You look. Of course, in Norway, you have the Nordic lights and they are really spectacular. And especially if you walk across the mountain, in wintertime, you know, you see the mountain tops sticking up and 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 and, and the Nordic lights flaming all over the oh, sky. Oh, that must that, be incredible. That, that must most... be really cool. He referred to that many times and was wondering why that happened. Uh, so that definitely was one of the inspirations for uh, for his uh, later endeavors. Those endeavors began with his studying physics at the Norwegian Institute of Technology. Later, he moved to America, where his engineering and business acumen led to the founding of Kavlico, a company that manufactured Fred's own design of sensors for aircraft and later automobiles. He sold the business in the year 2000 for $345 million. At the end of the ownership of the business, he started to think about what he would do with all the wealth. He wanted to create something of long-term benefit for humanity. The idea initially was to set up a foundation, but the area wasn't very clear in the very beginning. What we did was basically look at it as a business. How can we gain maximum impact? And I think that in basic research, we found an opportunity. It was, a, in a way, an undeserved market. That fact that he was um, really appreciative of the importance of basic research, for me, was an enormously um, appealing element of the opportunity. And uh, uh, it was at that moment that I knew that that was something I really wanted to do and to help him uh, develop that, that vision with him. So to animate that vision, Fred, through me and other people, tabled a number of different meetings with scientists, with people who led large scientific institutions, universities, and other business people and other people who had founded foundations, and he listened, which was one of Fred's great, great capabilities. Yeah, I remember he and I had a conversation. Then uh, he said, uh, uh, can you kind of organize, bring some Nobel laureates, laboratory directors, and the university presidents and all that together? So I said, OK, I can invite a group of people to come to our house uh, on a Saturday. It is uh, during that time, and uh, he, I think he formed his idea about the Kavli Institutes. The Institute for Theoretical Physics at UC Santa Barbara needed funds for its new building and for an endowment to support then-director David Gross's vision to expand the Institute's programming. With funding from the foundation, it could become the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics. So Henry presented it to the board uh, on David's behalf, and I have to say, it was controversial at the time. Not everybody was in favor of it, but both Fred and I saw it as an opportunity that should be seized that would make a difference and that it could be built upon. And out of it, of course, came the whole program of Cavalry Institutes, which are our major, our major uh, focus at the foundation. At the time, the endowment that he had set up for the foundation was in the range of just a few hundred million dollars. Um, and uh, while that may sound like a large amount of money, when you start thinking about what you're going to do with it, it's actually not a lot. And so it was something that I helped him with was the, the need for a strategy in terms of choosing areas and a methodology that would have the greatest impact. 
and to actually do visits to campuses, to various labs, to find out what the key science was and, and what the greatest opportunities w would be. One of the campuses Fred visited was the University of Chicago. And he wanted to see our telescope. So it's, of course, it's in the middle of Chicago. You can't see very much, but it's more than the naked eye. So we climb up these rickety stairs to get to look out at the heavens. And Fred, you know, was not a young man. We were a little worried, but he charged right up those stairs. And there was this look of wonderment and just the joy of being able to do science in this fashion. And so that's what I think about with the Kavli Institutes. There's this joy, there's this purity, there's this ability to investigate nature, to make discovery. I met Fred in 2003, just as we were working out the details of founding the first Kavli Neuroscience Institute at Yale. He came to visit. We had a marvelous time, actually. He walked around campus. I gave him a little tour of some of the historical buildings. He was fascinated uh, at the campus architecture. Fred put his hand on one of the buildings and he said something to the effect that this will last forever. And what I think what he meant by it is that Yale was a permanent institution with a long-term vision and a commitment and the resources to, to go on in perpetuity. And I think Fred, you know, if you think about Fred's science philanthropy, it's very much the same thing. In March 2004, the Kavli Foundation held a briefing announcing the first Kavli Institutes. We have been working for over two years exploring ways we could advance scientific research. We have traveled to campuses around the world, talking with leading scientists and researchers and university presidents. We have heard firsthand how we could act as a catalyst by providing financial support that is unrestricted for startup projects. These thoughts have contributed to the creation of the Kavli Institutes. In introducing the directors of the first nine institutes, Fred talked about why he had chosen the foundation's fields of focus, astrophysics, theoretical physics, nanoscience, and neuroscience. The universe is so big beyond, the, beyond imagination yet composed of particles so small beyond comprehension. And those little creatures that have taken command of the planet Earth, not because of their strength, not because of their longevity, but because of their brain. In the following years, Fred Kavli and his team traveled to universities around the world to expand the Kavli Institutes and strengthen the network. One of those visits was to Trondheim, Norway, in the lab of Edvard and Maybrit Moser, who had just made a discovery that later would win them the Nobel Prize. Cells in the brains of rats and people that help us find our way around. That was just a few months after we had discovered uh, the so-called grid cells, which is part of our brain's navigation system, was still not published. So we showed it to uh, Fred and to David, and I was totally excited. I mean, they both had a physics and engineering background, but they saw the significance of it. But I remember that I was so fascinated to, to see this very simple figure where we had printed out uh, this grid cell pattern. And they were just, wow. And they said, OK, you, you should be a, a Kavli Institute. You should apply. That was, uh, that was such a shock for us, because uh, we didn't think that was possible. The first ever meeting of all the Kavli Institute directors in 2007, on the occasion of Fred Kavli's 80th birthday, was a key moment in the evolution of the Kavli Foundation. There were panel discussions that I had the pleasure to moderate, but more than anything, the meeting fostered new collaborations, both within the disciplines of astrophysics, nanoscience, and neuroscience, and between them, and it was an opportunity for new institute directors to realize they were now part of a family. And since then, it has been a, a family, so uh, we learn from each other, I think. We felt we were welcome into a family, protecting us and believing in us. 
And it helped other institutions believe in them, too. That became clear when the Foundation began discussions with then-director of the Institute for the Physics and Mathematics of the Universe in Tokyo, Hitoshi Murayama. What was very important for me was the Calvary name because we were a brand-new institute. We aspired to become a world-class international institute, so we had to get visibility. And so that everybody knows, oh, okay, there's a new institute in Japan, and even Calvary Foundation validated it. And that's a very important thing for us. And in fact, the Calvary Foundation uh, making us a Calvary Institute greatly helped us to really bring up a status and, and become a world-class institute afterwards. And of course, having Calvary name attached to it was very important as well because, uh, you know, once there's an endowment, why would government want to stop that? So that was another sort of a, a uh, uh, the leverage we had in arguing for making institute permanent. The fact that Kavli IPMU, like all the Kavli Institutes, is funded through an endowment gives it not only longevity, but maybe even more importantly, freedom. These endowments are flexible. So if you have a fantastic graduate student that you want to support, if there's a critical piece of equipment that you need to buy, you can do that through this endowment. Uh, for instance, we have been using the uh, Kavli support to, um, to secure frontier equipment such as the helium neon gallium focus ion beam instruments. And that's very, very powerful instruments. And there aren't too many around. And with that, um, that really enables uh, novel research, nanoscience research for, for the entire campus. Research at MIT, like at all the Kavli Institutes, has greatly benefited from the fact that institute endowments provide greater flexibility than conventional grant funding from government. The money from the endowment can be spent as the institute's director wishes. I think the initial endowment, including matching funds, was less than $10 million, which only uh, $10 million would yield about $400,000 a year. Uh, but it was discretionary money. And before that, the director of the, uh, what was then called the Center for Space Research had no discretionary funds at all, or almost none. Um, and so this allowed her uh, to make some really uh, bold uh, moves. And the most important one uh, was uh, putting together a proposal for uh, a satellite called TESS. In the end, it was $200 million, uh, almost half of which was just for the launch. Liftoff, the SpaceX Falcon 9 carrying TESS, a planet hunting spacecraft that will search for new worlds beyond our solar system. Having that uh, $400,000 a year uh, of Kavli funds um, allowed me to find other funds, and it just would not have happened without the Kavli funds. Uh, that satellite now has uh, discovered uh, something like 2,000 candidates for um, planets orbiting around a nearby star. So it's been a great success. And when you go to a donor or a philanthropist and you tell him, uh, if you give me X money, we can spend 2X because we have this other money from the Kavli Foundation. That's, that's a, a, a very wonderful way for us, not just to, to, to take funding that we get from the Kavli Foundation, but also to, to, to multiply it with the, with the help of many others who want to support this kind of scientific research as well. But individually, I don't think they have the means uh, to support that, something at that scale. Today, with an annual budget of more than $36 million, the Kavli Foundation has established and funds 20 Kavli Institutes around the world. But the Institutes were only one part of Fred Kavli's original vision. So now comes the Kavli Prize. This is, this is really big stuff. It's very exciting. You, this will be an important prize in science, won't it? Yes, the prizes are very, very important. You call attention to what the scientists are doing to to call it, to make the public aware of the importance of science and, and also uh, to uh, encourage scientists to do the very best work they can, of course. Well, the prize was something that was always on Fred's mind. And uh, again, it was interesting because we studied it. Uh, we studied all the prizes that were out there, including obviously the Nobel Prize. 
Uh, again, it was controversial among the board whether it was something that should be done or not be done. Fred was very determined that it should be done, and, uh, but it had to be done in the right way. And what we learned from studying other prizes is that to gain the prestige that we wanted it to gain, it had to be uh, developed through somebody like the Ministry of Education and Research in Norway. It had to be bestowed by the royal family. And most importantly, it had to be selected by independent juries that were highly respected. So there are lots of practicalities that needs to be taken care of. But I think that the, the, the selection of committee members is very important because that has to do with the reputation uh, of the prize, the standing of the prize, that uh, the committee members select uh, laureates that are recognized by the scientific communities. Um, that is very important for the standing of the prize, and I think they have been very clever in doing that. And so, where will it happen? What, 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 what will be the, 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 uh, the circumstances of giving Oslo, away the prize? In Oslo. It's going Oslo? to be a ceremony first. Um, we're hoping the king will attend, and it's going to be, be nice. And indeed, the king of Norway, or the crown prince, has attended the biennial Kavli Prize ceremony since the first one in 2008. And since 2010, so is its co-host. It's great to have you back in Oslo Thank again. Thank you. I love being here. Thank you. This is the 2012 here. ceremony. One of the laureates in neuroscience was Corey Bargman. Actually, attending the ceremony for the Kavli Prize in Norway was an incredibly exciting and rewarding experience. And part of it was that there you are in Oslo, and it seemed like the whole country was excited about science and about learning more about science. And one of the things that they were excited about the year that I won was that in all three areas, neuroscience, nanoscience, and astrophysics, for the first time, women were among the awardees. One of the winners was Millie Dresselhaus, who was at MIT. She was the nanoscience winner. She's done an enormous amount of work on carbon nanotubes and other kinds of carbon formulations. When she came up to King Harald, he said, I hear you are called the queen of carbon. And she said, why, yes, I am. And he bowed and he said, I am the king of Norway. Remarkably, out of a total of 54 Kavli laureates, eight have later become Nobel laureates. The year the Kavli Prize was launched, 2008, was also the year the global financial crisis began, presenting the new president and CEO with a major challenge when he joined the foundation. We were in a deep, deep economic hole. Uh, and everyone, Kavli Foundation included, but other foundations too, all froze. And so the challenge that we had for the first two or three years that I was there was, how do we stay relevant and impactful when we have a budget that can't grow, we have a lot of commitments, and so um, what do we do? One thing the foundation did was to provide broader and deeper support for scientific societies. This was able to advance science with relatively modest sums, and it had a great impact. The second thing we did was something that became a pillar of our strategy. It had not been beforehand. Uh, so sometimes from the depths, you know, you, you learn things that really ultimately make an enormous difference in the future. And that was what we today call our strategy of catalyzing and enabling science through convenings, through meetings. Let us try to understand where we think the forefront issues are and let's convene uh, people from inside the fields but also outside the fields, get different points of view. And that led to a meetings program that we became quite exceptional at. Uh, it led to some extraordinary outcomes. Maybe the most powerful example of this was a convening that brought together scientists in neuroscience and nanoscience to discuss things like the idea that it will soon be possible to record millions of neurons firing simultaneously in the human brain. I knew that was going to be an important meeting. I didn't know what was going to come out of it, but I knew it was going to be important. Why? Because nanoscience was where all of the sensors that one would like to do measurements in the brain 
That was where they were going to come from. The enthusiasm with which the Kabuli Foundation suggested this idea really seemed to, to hit a chord and led to the announcement by President Obama of the Brain Initiative not long thereafter. So there, there's this enormous mystery uh, waiting to be unlocked. And the Brain Initiative will change that by giving scientists the tools they need to get a dynamic picture of the brain in action and better understand how we think and how we learn and how we remember. And suddenly we had a $5 billion initiative. Basically, that meeting changed the course of neuroscience in the United States. And uh, it's something I'm very proud of. But there were all these dots that had to be connected. We would have no brain initiative if we hadn't had that original meeting. Everything starts somewhere. When Fred Cobley died in 2013, he endowed the foundation with an additional $400 million. When we learned of the extent of his legacy to the foundation, the challenge for us was how do we live up to that commitment? The decision we made was that we were going to immediately support science for the benefit of humanity and not wait. So we were able to endow new institutes. We were able to create uh, additional capabilities in our staff and in our systems. We were able to move our headquarters campus into Los Angeles to be closer with our constituencies. We endowed at the National Academy of Sciences, the Fred Cavalier Auditorium, and we also increased the size of our headquarters campus to include a conference center so that scientists could meet on either coast to advance science for the benefit of humanity. Among the beneficiaries Hello, of the hi. extra funding was the oldest Center for Communicating Science at Stony Brook University. We trained scientists in communication skills, focusing on improvisation to improve their ability to connect with the rest of us. <laughs> when she laughs, she's not laughing. <laughs> with Kavli funding, we were able to greatly expand our program, and we've now trained over 15,000 scientists. That funding also marked the start of a foundation initiative that focuses on public engagement with science. With Alan, we suddenly had another vehicle, and that was Alan's interest in science communications. And we thought, how can we develop a few programs? Again, we had to think about it where we couldn't spend tens of millions of dollars, but maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars. How do you have an impact? And the thought I had anyway was, we have to support people who have a big megaphone. If we can get people and provide some upfront money, it's like catalyzing science. If we can catalyze the public engagement, activities of others whose job it is to do that, we could have a much bigger impact. Um, the foundation's work in public engagement has indeed focused on that aspect, helping science communicators and professionals in public engagement build stronger networks and practices to better connect science and society. One example is the Civic Science Fellows Program, which is also supported by the Rita Allen Foundation. These are scientists, these are people working with science um, societies, but they're also people who are journalists and people who are communicators and who uh, practice uh, different kinds of uh, public engagement and who all, uh, you know, care very much about the environment uh, for science to, to uh, both um, advance and, uh, and benefit our society. And with dramatic advances in science, like the ability to manipulate human genes using the gene editing tool CRISPR, there's a need to engage the public in the ethical issues that this and other technologies are creating. The co-inventor of CRISPR, Kavli Prize laureate and now Nobel laureate, is Jennifer Doudna. She and Kavli and we all have an understanding that it is not just enough to have some solutions, some new tools, but also we have decisions to make. So having an opportunity to have dialogue and to understand what the uh, trade-offs are and what the values are and how we uh, can use these new tools uh, for greater public benefit is extremely important. Also starting up under the Foundation's leadership is the Science Philanthropy Alliance, 
a consortium of foundations dedicated to funding curiosity-driven research. Beginning with an initial group of six foundations, the Alliance has now grown to over 30. I would say that one of the more enduring contributions of the Kavli Foundation was its leadership in 2011 in launching the Science Philanthropy Alliance. Uh, this was something that uh, Bob Kahn himself was um, uh, worked very hard to establish along with um, the Moore Foundation and others. And it was a time when there were uh, a number of philanthropists who wanted to support basic research, but they were each uh, almost reinventing the wheel in terms of how to set up their foundations, how to select areas of emphasis, uh, how to uh, give out grants and awards, um, how to measure success. I think by any measure, it's just been an enormous success. It can point to uh, over a, a billion dollars of new philanthropic funding for basic science that was influenced by the Alliance. The deepening of the Codley Foundation's commitment to science writ large was its support for a series of meetings in the Fred Codley Auditorium titled Frontiers of Science. In early 2020, a meeting was held to mark the 75th anniversary of a groundbreaking report. The report written by President Roosevelt's science advisor, Vannevar Bush. The meeting's goal was to ignite discussions about the next 75 years in science. At the time that Vannevar Bush wrote his report, the single PI laboratory and individual accomplishment was still the watchword for the day. Whereas now, large team science is the way work is being done. And so we have to uh, adjust to a time when large groups are the way that actual um, major accomplishments are uh, being done. Now, the major discoveries are mostly interdisciplinary. Um, the um, radical merging um, of engineering with biology, with physics and big data, and the social sciences all put together. So these are the sorts of things that were discussed at this meeting. And um, one reason why private philanthropy is going to be ever so much more important in the next 75 years because it is far more nimble than uh, government funding, and it can be the glue that um, holds together disparate pieces that can be so siloed uh, through government programs. The issue right now is that 1945 is on 2020, and the next 75 years will be very different. And Kavli Foundation recognizes that, and Bob Cohn recognizes that, and, and, and Bob feels, and I strongly agree with him, that. We, it's good to do discovery science. That's the mother of all sciences. That's absolutely necessary. But we also have to pay some attention to using fundamental science, basic science, to advance and solve major challenges the world is facing, like climate change or like pandemics. And in that, I fully agree with him. And, and the connection between science and, 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 and technology and the economy of the nation and the economy of the world, those are very tightly connected. Bob Cohn is putting a, a flashlight on that, on that interaction, on that activity. Uh, I applaud him for that, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud that I'm trying to help him uh, move the needle in that direction. The boy in the mountains of Norway wondering about the northern lights grew up to see his dream, enhancing science for the benefit of humanity, come true. You know, this has been a remarkable 20 years. And the foundation has found itself in a place I think it would have been very hard to imagine 20 years ago. It's amongst the great science foundations in philanthropy today. But you don't get to an end point like that without a great vision, a great strategy, and great people. Fred had a great vision early on, and he worked with great people 
to move that along through the first decade. And in the second decade, uh, after Fred's passing, he left us again, twice as much as he started with, and with a great board of directors, really visionary, with great people who could execute on a vision and a real long-term strategy now with three times as much money as we had at the beginning. You get all of that together and get it all on the train and get the train moving down the track, you get a very, very long way down that track. I wish he were with us today to see what we've achieved. And I wish he'd be with us 20 years from now to see where we'll be then. But uh, Fred wanted to make a difference. The people who he enrolled with him on this journey wanted to make a difference. And we have made a difference.